20% of the jobs in the future we don't know they exist nowadays. So influencer was not a job that well, it existed before, like models were influencers and actors were influencers, you know, but it was not a job like you or me will think like, oh, let's be influencers, <laughs> you know, and now you go to a primary school and 25% of the children want to be influencers, like. And I was thinking, I mean, oh my God, this is one of the person that has been nominated most to the Oscars, you know, yeah. one of the, uh, like, female actors with more Oscar nominations, very recognized, you know, I mean, I, I love Mary Streep and I was like, how is it possible that this has suffered, you know, gender pay gap? Our guest today is Dr. Sofia Izquierdo Sanchez, a senior economist and lecturer at the University of Manchester. She has written a number of publications on creative industries as well as featuring in the news for a paper on the gender pay gap in Hollywood. We will dive into her academic journey, the economics of creative industries, and the perspective of an economist on the social dilemma. Why economics? <laughs> okay, so um, so first, I don't think I didn't come into economics because of vocation <laughs> at all. In fact, I I didn't know what to do at all uh, up until even when I finished my A levels. Like I don't think it's one of these careers in which most people select because of that and. The reason why I decided to study economics in the first place is because my two parents are economists mm -hmm. and my late father was um, a tax and fiscal consultant and I remember him as a little girl always knowing what to say in social gatherings, always knowing about what's going on in the news and what was happening and I thought, oh, well, this is a useful degree to have. So I said, well, let's study economics, but obviously I liked it. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think I liked it enough to do a PhD while I, while I was an undergrad. Oh, really? But I knew what I really wanted to do is to uh, go one year abroad while I entered mm -hmm. my degree. So I wanted to be part of the year abroad uh, exchange program, which it was called Erasmus, which was the funding program by the European Union. My university had an agreement with the University of Bristol. So and this is how I landed in the UK in the first place. So I went there and I had very good, a couple of very good lecturers at the University of Bristol who really marked my experience as a student. So I guess good lecturing is mm -hmm. what put me in the path of deciding to continue wow. and doing a PhD. And this is how I ended up in academia. And how I ended up in the creative industries was just because I applied to Lancaster. My two PhD supervisors had this project in the creative industries going on. I thought I loved it. I thought it was a great mm -hmm. idea and this is how I arrived here. So it was kind of more like kind of me wanting to go there, but also kind of life driving me. <laughs> so you, you've been doing academia for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, what is a day in a life? What does a day in a life look like as <laughs> an economist? Busy and actually I, I'm very glad that you asked me that question because I don't think when you are a student, and me included when yeah. I was a student, I don't think mm, you know more than us just teaching like for like one hour or two mm -hmm. hours, hopefully fun two hours. <laughs> uh, so obviously we have the teaching part in which it doesn't just involve delivery, but uh, curriculum planning, uh, scheduling, delivering. Uh, we have our research part, and what well, you have very good examples in Manchester. We are a research intensive university. You have very good research leaders at the department. And we have also a part that is service within the school and the department. Okay. So that would be, would, would, it would depend on the academic, but this mm -hmm. would, may involve interaction with, for example, things like employability or like. Uh, other roles like uh, program directors or deputy directors. In my case, I am the BA account uh, deputy director in charge of oof, program curriculum and employability. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so it involves very different aspects that somehow they have to come together. <laughs> and, uh, and then we will have other uh, parts like uh, external engagement. And uh, yes, yeah, so it's, uh, it's, it, it's quite, it's quite different to other type of jobs. Also, it involves a part of our own type of uh, timetable management. Okay, mm -hmm. so we don't have a strict timetable time, like from nine to five. Yeah. Okay, which it makes it sometimes difficult. 
but also it gives you a lot of flexibility <laughs> to be fair it's not hard though like i mean on there days where you just like i don't i'm not bothered to do anything yes of course but then it means that you have to do that thing okay another time <laughs> oh so you still have deadlines to meet yeah we will have deadlines to meet we will have oh, research okay. deadlines to meet we will have well the teaching deadlines to meet will be the most obvious mm -hmm. obviously um and and other deadlines involved so that that will exist another commitment sometimes there will be more long run sometimes there will be more in the short run yeah but uh and sometimes it will be almost more personal deadlines mm -hmm. that uh, we will have to manage over a long on time but yeah how, how do you do that like how do you personally go about managing your time because on the and on that note of research what would you say is like the thing that drives you every morning or that thing that makes you want like excited to kind of go into work or keeps you going because you've been doing this for a long time surely there's something that like you know drives you to keep on this um, path that may, may depend on, on a specific thing it may depend on the day or on the week but i love my job mm -hmm. i love every aspect of my job so mm -hmm. uh, i love the teaching part i love being involved for thinking about what can I do to develop the curriculum, what can I do to what, to make more specific modules more exciting or like uh, face new challenges. Mm -hmm. And I learn every year also from what I teach. I think there is a learning process, not for the students, but also from me. I love the part of service and how to contribute to the, um, to not just to the department, but also to the school. And I find my research incredibly exciting and uh, how to work. I particularly like also to work in the, into interdisciplinary teams mm -hmm. and to uh, learn not just from the economics part, but also from other, other disciplines. So depending on the week, I have, I work more in one thing or another, okay? Depending, but uh, uh, I, I, I I always like I think I've been lucky in that sense that they, although I said at the beginning well I was just choosing this not from a vocational side mm -hmm. but you know kind of found it found me they found you I was lucky to find it so quick I'm glad, <laughs> I'm I glad. Liked. <laughs> yeah. we're, we're definitely gonna get into the research side you mentioned because um, I found that really interesting but just before that yeah post crush we love our economists so if you hosted a dinner party and you got to invite two or three economists from all over history. Who would those two or three economists be? I think the first one that came to my mind, okay, and this is I think because I, I went to the University of Bristol, it will be um, Mary Palais, and I, I hope I'm getting the pronunciation right here. <laughs> uh, because see, if I got this right, she was the first woman who was teaching economics in the United Kingdom, okay? But uh, I may have to double check the pronunciation of the name. <laughs> but uh, and then, in fact, the uh, economics building at the University of Bristol is named after her. Oh wow! And that's uh, why I got with this. Uh, the uh, second one. So I have to mention a classic one, right? But let's go for a <laughs> let's go for an obvious one, like. Uh, Let's go for a classic one like Adam Smith because he's the father of modern microeconomics. Kind of <laughs> Micro 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 we'll allow it. You know, just uh, to talk about how things have evolved <laughs> since then. And, uh, and then um, I love to meet the Karen Nobel Prize also, yeah. and the, uh, Claudia Goldin. I love to meet her. I know, I know she's, uh, she's still alive, mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, I. Um, I love also to meet her, and mm -hmm. uh, especially because it relates to my. Um, to be, I mean, to be honest, there are many many names that come to my mind. I mean, like uh, in the past and and now that uh, that I love. And Claudia's that Nobel that Prize was wasn't too long ago. It was really recent. Exactly, that's why so, I said the uh, yeah. recent. Uh, but uh, it relates a lot to my uh, job in the Hollywood uh, mm -hmm. Gap, Absolutely, you know, and I think it was. Uh, a very good recognition to mm -hmm. uh, um, to what she calls the motherhood root and like all these pick up differentials yeah. and uh, see um, not just her but uh, the fact that she won the Nobel Prize uh, make a difference mm -hmm. so she would be a good person to have you know actually it's a funny note uh, what I was thinking is that 
this completely personal thing, but uh, for a wedding, because I'm a written economist, for our name tables, we had economist. Oh, all really? around the world, so we have to think about actually name of a famous economist in which people oh, have wow. to sit down. So actually I was thinking about the names that uh, we, uh, we had for the table. That's such a creative idea. Who we uh, decided <laughs> to put them when you asked Did the guests question. like know who's like who the economists were or was it's it like an inside joke? Because like I'm assuming like there's like for most people like we know like you know the top economists and then there's so many more that like was it like, yeah, did you just pick the classical ones or was it like... No, we tried to go for a variety of them. Uh, we did we did have classical mm. ones, of course, like Schumpeter, like Keynes, you know, which by the way would be also an interested one to meet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because uh, uh, I, I was between Keynes and Adam Smith when I talk about a classic one. <laughs> but, um, mm -hmm. um, uh, but, but, uh, but then we also had uh, other ones that were not classical I mean we had like 15 tables so <laughs> we have to have a really lot uh, yes um, uh, but also there are also other like Nobel prizes in behavioral economics which mm -hmm. were also very relevant and uh, um, I mean there are, there are many that we'll be very interested to talk with uh, yeah. <laughs> in, uh, in life I mean we have amazing people in the department you know like yeah. uh, Rachel Griffin is uh, an amazing person to have absolutely with it's one of the reasons we wanted to do these interviews because like there's so many like there's so much talent uh, both with academia and students that it would be good to kind of just like share it with people and kind of yes. just like hear about their kind of stories so yeah I'm really glad you mentioned that um, a lot of your work was in the creative industries especially Hollywood so there's a lot of economics in Hollywood. Um, you mentioned in one of your papers, so movies are uncertain products. With post-COVID, it's even more of a question. How do these films even make money? Like, or get the funding to make these films if they don't know how well it's going to perform? Well, there are different strategies that actually studios follow. And uh, so first of all, uh, there is a very clear a structure on the organizational of uh, the film industry. It's one of the clear examples of oligopoly. So there are very mm -hmm. big six studios in the film industry, and many of the, your names will come to your mind, like Disney, you know, Paramount. And the reason for this, uh, and there is vertical integration, and by this I mean many of the creators work directly for these studios. Right? So they are integrated already. Mm. with the distributors. So the distributors, the creators, are like the same big holding company. And this is to try to minimize risks, okay? And uh, there is other ways of going around this, which is cross-subsidization between films. So there will be high-risk films in which with high spending budget, lower spending budget, okay? You will have advertising. The other things, like for example, if you have a big superstar in the film, they already know they may have some film goers going because people want to see, yeah. you know, Brad Pitt in the film or Angelina Jolie, okay, mm -hmm. let's just say an example. But yes, there is big uncertainty. There is some research preliminary to the film research, mm -hmm. to the film release done uh, to see uh, with expected demand, okay. Uh, obviously these things can vary, mm -hmm. yeah. Now the question is like, what about independent creators or independent distributors? Yeah. This is why it's an oligopoly which is so dominated. Mm -hmm. In reality, well, social media has given a really good platform for independent creators and distributors to be able to release uh, yeah. films, which below maybe it was not that available for this, you know, but it's still a huge risk. It's still like, may not become that successful. We still find some sleepers, which is called in the film industry, some movies that are predicted not to perform well. And suddenly, thanks to social media, yeah. thanks to information cascades that also have a research about it, they, you know, they become incredibly famous and they manage to be blockbusters. So, moving on, um, you mentioned, you know, your paper on the gender pay gap in Hollywood. That, um, so, can you talk me through how that actually happened? So, um, you mentioned, I think, in one of our events, it took you, like, it, it, it took a kind of a while to kind of get the data, uh, especially with Hollywood, you mentioned like it wasn't really easily accessible. 
So how did that happen? Like, how did you decide you want to look into Hollywood and? So listening to the radio in the car, mm -hmm. we <laughs> I was listening to an interview by Meryl Streep, mm -hmm. in which she was um, complaining about uh, pay, about this uh, gender pay gap issues, and I was thinking. I mean, oh my God, this is one of the person that has been nominated most to the Oscars, you know, yeah. one of the, uh, like, female actors with more Oscar nominations, very recognized, you know, I mean, I, I love Meryl Streep, and I was like, how is it possible that she has suffered, you know, gender pay gap, mm -hmm. this woman, and so I called one of my, well, my co-author in the paper, Maria, at Lancaster, and I said, should we, she's a labor economist, this is why I call her. And then I said, should we, should we look into this? And we very happily said yes. And then one of the problems of the creative industries, and this is why there is no much done in the field of economics, it's like it's really difficult to get data because it's private, in, they are private industries, so mm -hmm. they are very reluctant to share the data. So the way we went around it is because there was some shared data, uh, we, kind of collected data ourselves from the data that was available from the 1980s to 2015 at that moment for all the movies that we had available. I think in total we have 1,200 movies with uh, for the different salaries available. And that's basically how we decided it from like hearing like actresses complaining and I was also very surprised it was happening in Hollywood because I thought this is an industry that has a lot of cultural influence because mm -hmm. if you think especially in America these people um, are not just actors they uh, have an influence in politics they have an influence on people yeah. you know so I thought I think it is relevant that these things don't happen don't happen anyway in any industry but also that a place where it has influences in the population you know particularly so that this can be solved or that can be tackled in a sense and this is how I started the problem is like when there are so many difficulties collecting data because mm -hmm. we did spend at the very least a couple of years <laughs> just with the data <laughs> like, um, well it's one of the big parts of the research is the data set yeah so when you finally published your report I noticed it garnered some media attention you know you're doing interviews um, there's like papers online um, I think it was reported over 40 wow. times in 14 different countries, yeah. That's incredible. So how like how did that happen? Um, or like was it all in one go? What was it like So if out? I remember correctly, the first media outlet we interested was The Observer, mm -hmm. from The Guardian. And from there, we started to get calls from different places. So uh, also we got radio interviews. Uh, um, I think most of the radio interviews were in the UK and in, and in Spain, um, but, but also it was reported in many uh, newspapers that they didn't call us for an interview, they just oh, worked okay. in there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but we also presented our results in the European, uh, in the European Association, and that uh, because they have a media press report on the papers that are presented, so press pick up a lot from, mm -hmm. from uh, pick up the idea from there. And this is how they started to call us. And, and because the, the female actors uh, kept reporting this issue, then mm -hmm. it got more and more media attention. You know, it was actually because it's a quite fancy topic. When we were presented to, presenting it in conferences, it was a paper that got so many comments, so many questions, which is really nice, mm -hmm. okay? But it was an ended up of like... Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. But I, I really enjoyed this. We hopefully... We have a revise and resubmit now, so hopefully we can say we'll publish it soon <laughs> because it's been a very good uh, amount of years working on it. <laughs> That's incredible. But it's, it's one of the things on this work is like the research part, it's slow. <laughs> you know, the whole process and I'm like, including the media process, well, then the challenges you face because I'm aware like in that kind of public facing environment, it's difficult to media. Yeah. And in fact, with the interviews, I was always very concerned because we know we are academics. We are not used to working with media. And everyone mm -hmm. was telling me, 
be very aware of what you answer because you know they can twist your words and you mm-hmm. need to be very careful with what yeah. to say, what you answer. And I was always really, really concerned about what to say, how to say it. But I quite enjoy uh, dealing with it, and mm-hmm. I quite like that you know it got attention that the people was interested and mm-hmm. uh, and. And you know, I actually, you know, uh, one of the um, most challenging things it was when it was published in the newspapers. Sometimes I was getting to read the comments of people. Mm-hmm. That's one of the things that I had to stop doing. Oh, really? Because uh, yes, because some of the comments were nice. Some of the comments were like absolutely like. Like if these people are earning so much money, like you know, like who cares if they earn like mm-hmm. mm, less millions or more millions or like oh this is bullshit. I lean like more on the so I then I I thought like oh this is what people means by media hate. <laughs> like, yeah, I guess you had the, the taste of that, didn't you? Money. Yes, I it's like a small yeah. taste of that and and at the beginning I thought oh, I'll reply to the comments then I was like. No. <laughs> at one point you just <laughs> decided like there's no point. <laughs> yeah, there's no point. Fair enough. Um, I'm sure there were many positive um, comments too. So Some of them, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so what kind of like um, positive feedback did you get from the report, be it from organizations, rep- um, reporters? No, I mean, one of the things is like there was nothing, uh, so nothing done with such a comprehensive data set mm-hmm. up until then, uh, up until now actually, because of the difficulty of finding data. And I think one of the things that I liked about this paper is like we it was not just the female actor saying, Oh, this exists, but it was us saying actually, uh, we actually saw that they are right. Like within these conditions, yeah. in these sectors they are right. They what they are saying, it does exist and it should be looked into it and there should be transparency and this shouldn't happen. Yeah. And you know what, I was also curious, did Hollywood like so since it was about Hollywood, did they respond to it, or did they? Do you know if any people there read it? I, I tell you what, we sent it to their agents, mm-hmm. and I tried to contact. I never got a response, so no, I don't know. But it's very difficult that they will. Uh, you know, I, mm-hmm. I never know if they read it or. <laughs> I mean, who is it that decides the pay in Hollywood anyway? Is it the? It's not the agents. It's the. So they they have agents that negotiate for them. Mm-hmm. But this is also what it makes very interesting to analyze this question in Hollywood because so there is all this um, psychology literature that analyzes of how we negotiate pay, you yeah. know, and they say like the differences in gender between, for example, male and female, how they uh, they are more risk loving or risk adverse. But actually, we claim, but they are agents negotiating, and if you are an agent. No, that all of them know very well the market, all of them independently of the gender of the agent, they should actually uh, yeah. be some like common ground. I'm sure Meryl Streep has like a really good agent. It, it's supposed to, you know, <laughs> like we don't have information on whether the agent is male and female, but mm-hmm. we should, but we assume that the uh, level of risk loving of like uh, risk adversity should not be as irrelevant as mm-hmm. if it is a normal person negotiating the salary you know so uh, there are certain things in this market that make it really interesting to uh, still find mm-hmm. the pay gap compared to other yeah. industries how was it with um so you mentioned with barbie um yeah. You mentioned what, and in like, fact, it was uh, market research, which belongs to the Wall Street Journal, contacted <laughs> me to talk about the Barbie movie. Oh, really? So it's still having interest uh, this research. Uh, which, uh, so have you seen, seen progress in in the recent movie and you know in general? So they they actually published their salaries, and we know that Barbie and Ken got exactly the same fixed salary. Mm-hmm. But there are two parts to the salary of an actor: yeah. the fixed salary and the variable one. Okay, and the variable one is how much are the, the percentage of the uh, profits that the movie does. I don't think that was published, so we don't know mm-hmm. if uh, Margot Robbie and Ryan Gosling got the same percentage negotiated. We just know that the fixed salary is the same. If at the end the variable salary was published, then I don't know. Okay, so but mm-hmm. like at the moment I did the interview had not been published. It was exactly the same fixed salary. Something that I did mention in the interview is like, 
obviously the main character was Barbie here. Yeah. So it would have been interesting to see if it was a Ken movie, mm-hmm. whether Ken would have been offered exactly the same fixed salary than Barbie or would have been offered more salary, yeah. you know? Like, that would be interesting. Yes, yeah, so whether this was actually a way of sorting out pay gap or like, <laughs> mm. I know, but, um, but yes, uh, the, um, the market research from the Wall Street Journal uh, with, um, contacted me about that to comment on that. Um, and that was actually the last interview I've done about this. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I love the movie, it. by the way. If anyone has not watched it, I really liked it. I thought it was a very good uh, critic satiric of uh, like um, uh, how a society perceives. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it was an interesting um, uh, concept. I mean, in the past few years, you might have heard of the Social Dilemma series on Netflix, which co- garnered a lot of attention. The way it's been phrased makes it look like the app is no longer the commodity but we are mm-hmm. so what are your thoughts on that yeah and i think the first thing that comes to my mind with this and i think everyone will think about it is advertising you know and mm-hmm. how they can target us i think okay so first of all two things from an economics point of view here um the way we spend leisure time has changed, obviously. I mean, we, we always, not sure we spend more time on leisure now. I mean, we always have a limited time to spend on leisure, mm-hmm. okay? It's just that it has changed. And there is this balance in economics that we studied between uh, the time that we spent on working and leisure time, okay? Now, obviously, a lot of time is spent on like social networks, internet, and so on. Now, advertising exists since many years ago, and advertising is this thing that adapts really well to how do we spend leisure. For example, we read a magazine, there are ads in the magazine, right? You go for a walk, you have ads in the street, mm-hmm. you know, newspapers, have multiple examples of this. But obviously, like internet, uh, social media, this is a great opportunity for advertising, okay? Yeah. Why? Because it's not like just they can reach out to a much wider audience, it's like they can actually uh, reach to targeted audience. It is very common, everyone will relate to this, Mm -hmm. that you look for a product in Google and then like minutes after Mm -hmm. you get like exactly that product advertised bombarded, no? Mm -hmm. There is something for a consumer which is the search cost of looking, so if you are, if you for example want to buy a microphone, you know, there is a search cost like of looking for the perfect microphone. So advertising could be useful in like selling you the characteristics and everything. So it saves you time of looking for the perfect uh, microphone. But of course, there is a limited uh, amount of advertising and would you reach it, it will decrease your utility, right? In economic terms. Mm -hmm. That limit is depends on the individual, okay? And how much it is. uh, for one individual, when the cost is that for one individual or another. Another thing that comes with social networks is all these influencers, right? Yes. On, um, uh, well, but that, from one point of view, yes, they may become products, but then it's a new job. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I was reading an article some, I think it was a year ago. It was um, economics of his, uh, he was an economist of a state in Spain, and he was saying it's funny to think how 20% of the jobs in the future, we don't know they exist nowadays. So influencer mm-hmm. was not a job that well, it existed before, like models were influencers and actors were influencers, you know, but it was not a job like you or me would think like, oh, let's be influencers, mm-hmm. you know, and now you go to a primary school and 25% of the children want to be influencers. Like, you, anyone can be, yeah, so you are just exposed to the, all this bombarding of like products. It's also so easy to buy, right? You just click and you just buy. Like, it's, mm-hmm. uh, so yeah, there is this whole dilemma of like, well, is it, are we creating all this like consumism, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, culture? Or like we just keep buying like uh, useless things that we becoming like uh, a product of advertising in like I think societies adapt, societies learned. We've always been exposed to technological change. It's true that in the last years, I think this has been mm-hmm. um, a big boom. Yeah. <laughs> like, but we will learn, we will adapt. It is my belief. I mean, this is not going back, you know. Mm -hmm. We just need to move forward and see. I mean, it is true that we serve a crazy amount of data. Whether you 
are willing to serve your data or whether you have a decrease in utility for that. I think that depends a lot on specific individuals. I know people that they don't want to have any type of social network because of this. Okay, mm -hmm. I know the people that they don't mind at all. Um, whether this is why also uh, regulation changes constantly. Mm -hmm. Okay, and it will continue to change. And I do really believe on evolution and <laughs> like things adapting mm. and things changing. Because um, it's not as heavily regulated as traditional media. No, of course, but because it's not been around for as long mm -hmm. as a long period of time, I think, you know, and yeah. it keeps changing. But, um, but it, it will happen. It's like artificial intelligence, you mm -hmm. know, like it's completely new. And then but it's going to happen, you know, it's like, I, I am not of the opinion that so we just pump artificial intelligence, no, because it's going to, you know, it's going to continue, it's going to evolve, we should learn what's the best way to use it, what's the best way to complement with it, and then what's the best way to regulate it, okay, mm -hmm. and continue evolving with the society, I mean, but obviously this is a completely personal opinion, <laughs> like, I mean, you completely disagree mm. with it. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's true in the sense that, like, I heard stories about elections, for example, like, people who lived in certain places got certain election adverts, and, like, you know, um, I think it was during the American elections where the way they did advertising on Facebook was quite cheeky. Um, so it's stuff like... Yes, and this is one of the things... Though. Yes, and probably this is one of the things that they may need to look at mm -hmm. how do you regulate these things, how do you control. There are other many things, like for example, in terms of like underage people, you know, come on, there's been so many issues of like mental health issues uh, with the uh, underage people are also, okay, overage, but underage is like more, they're more mm -hmm. vulnerable, you know, and uh, with bullying, you know, on social networks now, how is called bullying always existed, but like uh, social networks is a platform in which is more widely available and, uh, and so on, you know, how all these things have to be regulated. And what is also, there is also a very thin line on what is the responsibility of the social network, you know, and what is the responsibility of, for example, of Facebook, of Twitter, and what is the responsibility of uh, the actual individual. It's not very clear, right, I think, of, uh, and, and I do believe there needs to be some regulation on that. Uh, because yeah. it's quite scary to think about <laughs> I mean, all the cases of hate that we were talking before, like yeah. experiencing this, that's, that's incredibly hard. And it's, it's a platform sometimes for people to do these things because it's kind of anonymous under quotations. And, and I think that's incredibly sad and that somehow should be, uh, there was, I mean, there was a very big debate also with what Elon Musk, right, was mm -hmm. doing with uh, X, which is now called <laughs> freedom of speech mm -hmm. under quotations, because, I mean, is freedom of speech under quotations? Because, well, is it when you are actually incentivating hate, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Um, and yes, I think that shouldn't, uh, I mean, something that actually it's detrimental for mental health and like definitely needs to be regulated. There should be some responsibility from the social networks for publishing that or like, or at least for the individual who publishes that. You know, how that can be done. I'm definitely no lawyer, no that the person that works in regulation at all. And I don't have any clue how they can do that. Mm -hmm. um, it is scary. Listen, as as a mom, it's scary to think like uh, yeah. how uh, my children are gonna be teenagers on that wall. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, to be fair, and the things that I hear from, I have friends who are um, teachers in secondary schools, and the things that they face now. You know, I was thinking, wow, that was not happening in my day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no. um, but. Um, um, but yes, but yeah, the same that they bring opportunities that they were commenting before. Mm -hmm. They bring challenges. That's like every every change. Um, but obviously, this is for a much wider audience. Yeah. Um, 
<laughs> I'm reading now, I don't know if you know Ken Follett, I'm reading now The Armor of Light, which is about the Industrial Revolution, mm. and about how the different introduction of machines in factories and so on. I love it. He's one of my favorite authors, by the way. And uh, um, this, all these changes in the UK like, brought so much revolution and mm -hmm. uh, innovation, and they didn't know how they were going to regulated, they didn't know how they were going to go around and how they tried to forbid all of that and all the revolution that came from that and all the problems. <laughs> like, um, yeah. and, and I was just thinking about that and how in the end now we see it as it was going to happen anyway. <laughs> you know, like, so, so changes oh. have always happened. It should there, is there like this fear of this bigger industrial revolution that we are or I think there is always for. fear to change. Mm -hmm. Same that happened with the lot of lights. I mean, like the, the with the first industrial revolution is exactly what I'm reading in the book. Is what happened. It was fear, right? And then now we look back in history, and for us it's like a story. And now we say like, but it was so obvious. No, what was gonna happen mm -hmm. in the end? That it makes sense what yeah. happened, you know. And I think someone in some years time will look back in history and will think like. Well, yes, what happened is obvious, you know. There is always fear, obviously, because there's going to be a change in jobs, in the dynamic that certain things work, mm -hmm. you know. There had to be new laws, there had to be new regulation, and then in the end, society adapts, we evolve. And we find a way. Yes, we find a way, and things work out, hopefully. Yeah, hopefully in, for the best. <laughs> in, in the words of, um, I'm going Jurassic Park, life finds a way. Yeah. So hopefully we will study it in the economics degrees. <laughs> hopefully, yeah. The, the next couple of econ students will be talking about um, exactly. all of this like, in the lecture halls. So yeah. I think they have something to look forward to there. So just before we wrap up, I wanted to uh, shed some light on daily life econ. So it's, your in, it's an initiative which, you know, you, um, in which you do um, sort of make economics accessible, right? Um, by applying or by showing how it applies to the daily life. So I need to ask, how did that come about? Because I think in all the years of experience that I have teaching, and also when I was an undergrad, I think everyone relates really easily to concepts for the broader economy. Okay, mm -hmm. you can see very, and especially because I'm a microeconomics lecturer. And I think microeconomics is one of the these subjects that people find more difficult, but also people find more difficult to relate to. And I always thought, but it's something that it happens continuously in your mm -hmm. life, you know? And then I thought, well, why would I do that? Not just for the students, but also to show people that, you know, economics is not just this thing that you continuously hear in the news, which also, you know, but it's much more than that, you know, it's about when you, go to order a coffee, when you make a decision in your household, when you, well, we could talk about this for hours, <laughs> you know. And then uh, this is when we decided to do this, we decided now to, uh, the main idea was to do this post or was to do these reels, not just to give like daily life examples, but to grab attention or like, listen, this is economics and you mm. want to know more. And, link to these resources, you mm, know, yeah. to try to engage, okay, uh, more uh, the students and see whether they could relate it to uh, concepts that they uh, that they learned about uh, in class. That's, re that's really cool. Um, is there one, an example of a topic that, so, that you think you're really proud of with daily life econ? Is there like a real or one piece of content that you're like, oh, wow, I am Actually, I, I thought about one just like the minute that I was this question because it completely switched the way in which we started to create content. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you remember, and in July it was the uh, three, what do, it's not known exactly the date, but more or less around that time, it was the, 300, uh, the 300th birthday of Alan Smith. And then we decided oh, we have to do something, you know, because he's such a big name in mm -hmm. economics. Yeah. And then we decided for the first time, Will and I went live on camera, we saw our faces, and we decided to do this comedy video in which a student didn't know who was Alan Smith, and Alan Smith goes into the library and mm -hmm. talks with the student. 
and we posted it and it is one of the videos that has the most views but also the most interactions and then lots of our friends started to share the video with us and telling us oh we've never heard about this name and suddenly we learned who this person was okay. and then we said like oh, people really liked it because it's a way of rapid attention which we, we just didn't teach who someone in economic was but also we did some comedy and people find it interesting mm -hmm. And then it's when we started to do more reels and we thought like, oh, people may like this type of content, may like us to work. We are not actors by any means. We just literally like... Your economic actors. So, yeah, exactly. We just give like, probably, no, hopefully not that boring, but very like boring comedy, one hour, two hour talks. <laughs> like, um, and then it's, there was a huge switch of how we created content in daily life. I can since then because we realized that was wrapping uh, mm -hmm. more attention. And then there was another one, which it was the Wimbledon one, the tennis I one, that which one. that one also was quite like people liked it. Also got quite a lot of comments uh, on how game theory works. And that seemed to grab more people's attention and then uh, learn a little bit about the concept and we realized not just for students but also for external people who was following the account and then we were going for dinners with our friends and say oh you know i never learned about this and now i know about this concept and we were like oh so maybe it's interesting also for other people <laughs> I, I really like the like comedy part like linking that with economics because yeah. um because yeah i mean it's, it's as you said economics is literally everywhere but we don't i mean we kind of need to see that yeah, who um, said economics is boring, you know? <laughs> exactly. Um, the funny thing is, like, I think when I studied, when I first heard about economics, and I think a lot of students can relate to this, the first word we think is money. And then it took me coming to university to realize... It is not. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> um, like, maybe there's, like, modules where we kind of learn about how it works, but with microeconomics, it's like... No, it's it's like... Is literally is very little about money, and I think it's more, if I understand correctly, choice, right? Yeah, yeah, uh, reallocation of resources. Yeah, yeah, so actually, it's funny you say that because when I was teaching first years, and I've been some years without teaching first years, if I am the first term for teaching first years, the way I used to start my lectures mm -hmm. was like, I'm gonna give you two minutes, and I want you to write in a piece of paper one word that you think describes economics, and then everyone had to put it up. And then after I gave them the two minutes, they were putting it up. And then I was saying, everyone who wrote money, put the paper down. And then half of the class put the paper down. It was the most popular choice by far, money. And then I was explaining from them what was economics and saying, well, money is part of that. OK, but it's like an exchange, uh, like mm -hmm. currency or exchange mode, you know, but it is not economics. And if you ask in the street, someone has had an economy, that would be the main word. But that was also a little bit the idea behind daily life econ. You yeah. Know, like so in the but you know, it's not just that. It's so many things economics as it's such a broad and interesting subject. Mm. I, I always find it interesting like why we attribute economics to money. Maybe it's just like the framing like on social media news we just see I think it's the news. economy and Yeah, I think it's the news and most of the people relates it to banking mm -hmm. and finance you know, there is links, in, there is this very big link to finance. And it's part of it, it's part mm -hmm. of economics, it's linked, but it's so much to economics. And, there is and it gives really you, general. yeah, it's a great degree to have. It mm -hmm. gives you very broad range of skills. Uh, it's, uh, it's a degree that is really well valued in the job market. Um, That's good to hear. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it is. So, um, but yeah. <laughs> Well, that's amazing. Um, so just wrapping up, um, you know, you, you mentioned a lot about, um, yeah, how useful it is of a degree. Um, you mentioned your, like, journey through academia, the whole um, gender pay gap report. Um, so with all that said, uh, what's one thing you'd like viewers to take home? Uh, from the interview? Um, uh, August. Um, I think, I, I tell you what, the, I'm going to take something away from home, from my short experience at Manchester, because I think also from this interview, but my short experience at Manchester, I am really amazed and impressed 
by the uh, how proactive as a student you are, and that's also coming from Postcrust, okay, and that's also sourced from this podcast, okay. I because I've learned so much from my experience lecturing at the at this university in the year that I've been here. Really, you've taught me and you've forced me to uh, diversify my own curriculum so much that I've really enjoyed my experience. And I think the fact that you are doing this podcast, okay, I wanted to show students more about us, wanted to show students know yes about what we do, but uh, well, yes about what we do, but also like the broad range of activities of research uh, that shows and says so much about your society but also so much about the students at this university and uh, i take home this but also as experience as a lecturer you know as for my whole career um yeah i Thank think you. it's fascinating um uh, does that answer your question Thank you so much. <laughs> so for the last question so something i'm trying to do every podcast is for every interviewer, I'm asking them to give me one question for the next person without knowing who they are or um, what the interview is about. One question, <laughs> one thing you'd like to know from them. And then we had an interview before this, so I would, I'd ask you the question he... Um... I'd like to ask them what, what they think, you know, is, is the most important way people can try and make change, really, I think is, is really good. And, you know, that's something I always find interesting to hear. Because people answer it differently depending on their own personal experiences and their, you know, political stance. So, you know, I think that's always a, a good question to ask. I, te I tell you all how I'm going to answer this question telling you how I found people has made an influence or change on me. I think, I think, and I'm going to relate a little bit to what we were talking about. I think when they inspire you, but when they are also empathetic and understanding with you, when you find that person that you have, you are confident enough to uh, be able to talk to them, but not just on a friend mode, okay? But mm -hmm. like, for example, this person that is your, uh, an official mentor in life, mm -hmm. okay? And I'm going to give you an example. So one of my PhD supervisors, who that is not, she's not in Manchester at all, but she kept being one of the persons who is uh, my friend, but who keeps inspiring me, who keeps like unofficially mentoring me and officially guiding me in life. And she's been always so empathetic, so approachable, uh, that, that, you know, that, facility, giving that facility to people to um, understand them, to make sure like showing empathy, mm -hmm. <laughs> basically, to people, showing an approachability, but also in other sense, inspiring them, what we were saying, inspiring teaching, inspiring lecturing in terms of academia, okay, um, that's how people have made impacts on me, so I hope that's how I can make an impact on people. You can make an impact on everyone. You know, you can, you know, like, to everyone. But yeah. <laughs> now that's such a nice answer. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> okay. um, so now your turn. Okay. Um, I think that you know what, what I answered to you about something that I, it marked my journey as a lecturer. Okay, here, like for example, meeting such an inspiring student, like I'm marking something that has marked their journey what being at Manchester, either as a student or as a lecturer, that they think they've made an impact on them that will carry on with them for their foreseen uh, journey, mm -hmm. either a student or in their lecturing journey, okay? What, what do they think that is that thing that really made an impact on their life? And it could be academically related wow. or personal related, you know, That's a person that they met or... Um, yeah. It's a powerful question. Yeah. <laughs> How would you answer it? Um, well, I will answer that actually it's just the, the students I met here. Mm -hmm. uh, it really surprised me. Uh, and I, and I, it's a challenge that, I tell you what, at the start I was, at the start I was a bit concerned about it because people talk about, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Manchester is a university known for challenging students. <laughs> and, but it doesn't have to be in that sense. And then I found, 
I found I really enjoy it because it's it develops my journey you know and I found myself trying to think about so many ideas to try to diversify the curriculum to introduce new things like social responsibility which I'm introducing in some of my modules this year as an example you know or things like that and it made me learn so much you know it doesn't matter I've been already well since I started my PhD 12 years but nine years of my lecturing journey and suddenly it made me like switch it was such a big inflation point for me this mm -hmm. university which I'm really happy about and uh, um, and I think everyone has from time to time like these switches in their career that they influence them and in every university that they've been I could say I was something that changed my point of view and you know your life is a whole learning process you never stop learning, and if you stop learning, something will go wrong. <laughs> powerful, powerful quote. Um, Dr. Sophia, um, thank you so much for joining us well, Thank today. you so much for inviting um, me. We learned so much, <laughs> and yeah, we appreciate your time.